The hero from Juness has arrived! And if you've been exposed to any spin-offs, forget everything you know about Yosuke gameplay-wise from those. Yosuke in the original game is actually a jack of all trades, having slightly above average stats in all areas except luck because, well, he's Yosuke. His raw strength and magic are actually higher than a lot of the party's specialists, but it's balanced out by his skill sets, which very much leans in the direction of Jack of All Trades Master of None. He learns a combination of physical attacks, wind elemental skills, status ailments, and healing. Although Yosuke's healing is really only useful for the very beginning of the game. It's great, don't get me wrong, for the beginning, but once more specialised healers join and you get better personas on the protagonist with healing skills, Yosuke rapidly falls behind in that department. The best he gets is a single target full heal, and that's not even on his main learn sets. He also stops learning status ailments past the early game, so later on his skill set almost exclusively focuses on wind attacks and buffing agility. And those are the main things he has over other party members later on. It might be a good idea to keep both Wind Boost and Wind Amp, since those skills stack with each other, to maximise his wind damage. I would also recommend keeping at least one of his physical skills, because what the game doesn't tell you is that every physical skill he learns has a higher than average critical rate. That can help when fighting the Gold Hand Shadows, we'll see those a bit later. And by the end of the game, even though he has nothing else to boost his physical power, Brave Blade alone is a very, very strong skill. One of Yosuke's biggest strengths, I find, is that very few enemies in the game are immune to both wind and physical. So while Yosuke may not be the best at anything, there are few situations where he's completely useless. What I've listed here are the skills that the party members learn through level up, and their stats at level 99, though they're an indicator of their general stat spread throughout the game. There are two other ways for party members to learn skills in this game, but I'll get to those later. Yosuke didn't change very much in Golden. Some of the skills he used to learn by level up were moved to those other methods, but apart from learning Mucka Jam now, he pretty much plays the same way he did in the PS2 version, and to some people that's a weakness, because some of the other party members got buffed a lot. Yosuke's persona is a character from traditional Japanese folklore, from the story The Tale of Jiraiya the Gallant. He was a ninja with the ability to transform into a giant toad. He fell in love with a classmate named Tsunade, who had mastery over slug magic, and his arch enemy was a former follower, Orochimaru, who had the power over snakes. And if these three names sound familiar to you, the three characters in Naruto with the same names are indeed based off of this legend. Naruto draws from a lot of ninja mythology. Another fact about this trio is, their story might be based off of an early version of Rock Paper Scissors which Japan imported from China. There, Frog beats Slug, Slug beats Snake, and Snake beats Frog. The sixth generation Pokemon Greninja is also a reference to the Legend of Jiraiya. Yosuke's bike skills are kind of average, which I guess is fitting for him. Now, if you've deleted Tentarafu by now, Panic Boost is completely pointless. In general, I find there aren't a lot of enemies in the game that are vulnerable to Panic. Negado is alright, but we'll be getting access to the higher tier Almighty spells later on both the protagonist and party members. Green Wall is the start of a theme. Most party members will learn their elemental wall skills through bike rides. Personally, I find there are better ways to cover weaknesses that don't require wasting someone's turn, but they're not terrible to have around if you want to use them. Makara Break is insanely situational. In fact, even more so than its counterpart for Tetracon, since I find very few enemies use Makara Khan, and when they do, you can just use almighty spells to get around it. Or even just physical attacks. Dear Rahan is probably the best skill Yosuke has here. It's the best healing he ever gets, though sadly it's still single target. 
I should also mention that in Golden, Yosuke will get a fairly decent multi-target healing spell towards the end of the game. So with that, and the fact that Diarahan essentially costs five days worth of social linking, I don't know if it's really that worth it. Suzanoo is the younger brother of the Japanese sun goddess Amaterasu, and along with her, one of the three gods born from Izanagi when he cleansed himself of the filth from the underworld. Often depicted as a god of the sea and storms, Suzanoo is a very complicated individual, capable of both good and bad. He had a bit of a sibling rivalry with Amaterasu, engaging in a contest to see which of them could birth the most gods. And after some heavy arguing and rules lawyering over who actually won, got so angry that he destroyed her rice fields. And flayed her heavenly horse. This led to Amaterasu hiding herself away in Amano Iwato, leaving the world in darkness. But he redeemed himself by slaying the serpent Yamato no Orochi, and presenting the sword he found in its tail, Kusanagi, to Amaterasu as a gift. Suzanoo has seen a major resurgence in Japanese pop culture in recent years. In fact, he's actually been the most common ultimate persona for party members in the Persona series. Used by Masao Inaba in the first game, and now Yosuke in this game. The art book for Persona 4 mentions that the party members' personas are in fact designed by their wielders. So, Suzanoo here appears to have a wind turbine for a head because that's what Yosuke pictures when he thinks Storm God, apparently. In terms of gameplay though, they finally threw Yosuke a bone here. He actually gets the biggest stat increase of any Persona evolution, getting plus 3 to strength, plus 2 to agility and luck, and plus 1 to magic and endurance giving him some of the highest raw stats of any party member. Besides luck, of course, he is still Yosuke. This actually puts his strength one point higher than Chie's at max level, but she has power charge and crit boost to make up for it. And despite how high it is, his agility is only the third highest of the party, behind Chie and Naoto. Suzanoo is another one of the ultimate personas who got nerfed and now has a weakness in Golden, alongside Chie and Kanji's ultimate personas. Still, that massive stat boost means it's well worth it to max out Yosuke's social link. Yosuke's ultimate skill is Youthful Wind. This is basically a combination of two skills. It's Masuku Kaja with a Medea Rama built into it. This late into the game, Medea Rama is not great in terms of healing, but at least it's multi-purpose, and it does mean that, yeah, you have a reason to get rid of Yosuke's other healing skills, so... Yeah, let's let's drop Masuku Kaja for this. Before we do, though, let's talk about, um, Takahaya Suzanoo. So obviously, he's still Suzanoo. Takahaya is just a title. It means rapidly building. And it's from one of the long-form names given for Suzanoo in the Kojiki. The full name is Takehaya Suzanoo no Mikoto. Mikoto is attached to a lot of um, deity names in Japanese mythology. The spunky dragon with a theme that sounds like something out of Sonic Adventure, Chie Satanaka enters the ring. Chie is the party's first physical specialist, although her stat build is a bit weird for one. Her strength is not that high, in fact Yosuke has higher strength than her by the end of the game. But her skill set has many ways to get around this, mostly by multi-hit attacks and critical hits. And here I'm actually going to talk about how Chie changed in Golden first, because it was a really big change. They only switched around two of her skills, her level 33 and 36 ones. She swapped out Buffala and Ice Boost for Apt Pupil and Auto Tarukaja. Now, Auto Tarukaja isn't that amazing, but Apt Pupil radically changes how Chie plays. In Golden, you want to keep that skill on her, because it combined with some of her social link skills make Chie a physical fighter focused entirely around critical hits. In Fire Emblem terms, she's a Swordmaster. This makes her useful at knocking down enemies that have no elemental weaknesses. 
while also increasing her damage output per turn by way of one mores. Speaking of which, she learned some ice skills, but even though her magic stat is not terrible for a physical attacker, the ice skills she learns are. I recommend just keeping Mabufu and not bothering with anything higher. Her ice skills are really only there for knockdowns. Early on in the game, you're stuck with Rampage for multi-target physical, and its accuracy is notoriously unreliable, but she eventually learns more reliable AoE attacks like Gale Slash and Heat Wave. These are actually the biggest asset she has over the party's second physical attacker who'll join later. Power Charge comes relatively late, but it's another must-have. And speaking of late skills, Rainy Death deserves special mention. Because its crit rate is obscenely high, especially backed by Apt Pupil and other boosts. Some people like keeping this on her even after she learns God's Hand, even though God's Hand is individually stronger. She also has the counter skills. Now these got nerfed since Persona 3, high counter used to have a 50% activation rate which was kind of ridiculous, but 20% is still pretty good. I don't think these stack with each other though. It's often said that Chie struggles a little bit in the mid-game, particularly that period where she only learns Black Spot and Heat Wave in terms of new physical attacks for about 20 levels. But I find others can pick up her slack during that time, while she's still very good early and late game. In general, Chie is usually better against normal shadows than against bosses while the second physical attacker of the party is the opposite, so consider that when choosing which to add to your party. Chia's persona is based off Tomoe Gozen, a 12th century female samurai. She served Minamoto no Yoshinaka in the Genpei War, and was famous for being his strongest warrior, and many legends depict her as a one-woman army. Many of these tales are probably exaggerations, but it was said that she could handle unbroken horses with superb skill, and this might be referenced in her persona design as she appears to be wearing a bike helmet. A lot of works love to depict motorbikes as the modern day equivalent of horses. Regarding her design, the yellow jumpsuit is a reference to Bruce Lee's film Game of Death, which fits into Chie's love of kung fu movies. And something I saw a few commenters point out is that Tomoe has long flowing black hair, very similar to Yukiko's. This could be taken as a representation of Chie's much healthier bond with Yukiko after accepting her shadow. Chie's bike skills are... interesting. She gets the Hummer skills as kind of a counterpart to Yukiko's Mudo skills, which gives her a bit of utility, especially against enemies immune to physical, though I generally find you have three other party members to handle those. But they're kind of an option. Mind Slice is, I believe, the only status ailment attack Chie learns, so that can be kind of alright for only two bike rides, but it's quickly outclassed later in the game. Tetra Break is, admittedly, a bit less situational than Yosuke's Makara Break, as I feel there are a lot of Tetra Khan using enemies in the game, but it's still extremely situational. Finally, there's Bufudine, which is the best ice spell Chie ever gets, so it's one of the only ways to make use of her somewhat decent magic stat. The problem is Chie lost Ice Boost in Golden. So if you want ice magical damage, I feel it's best left to Teddy since he has both boost and amp and a better magic stat. Suzuka Gongen seems to be a bit more obscure of a figure in Japanese mythology than some of the other ultimate personas, partially because when you do a search for her online, almost all the results come from Persona 4. But I'll try to find some info anyway. It appears that she's a legendary Japanese female figure from the Kamakura period. That's 1185 to 1333. This is the era where samurai first became prominent and feudalism was established in Japan. But it seems that myths can't really decide on exactly who she was. She's been a goddess, a female oni, or even a female bandit. In one legend, she was a warrior married to the king of the oni, but who fell in love with a human sent to slay him. She then betrayed the Oni King by killing his retainers and allowing the hero to enter his castle. So while sources can't quite agree on exactly what she was, 
The common trend is she was a powerful warrior woman. And that definitely suits Chie, but one more element I want to talk about is this persona's visual design. In the art book, it's mentioned that Tomoe appears to be wearing something like a bike helmet, but it becomes more of an off-road dirt bike helmet upon evolution into Suzuka Gongen. This represents Chie's growth, as while ordinary bikes have to stick to the roads, dirt bikes can head off the beaten path and go wherever they want. In terms of gameplay, in the original Persona 4, Chie had no weaknesses upon awakening Suzuka Gongen. That's not the case here. But she does gain a resistance to light, and her ice resistance turns into an immunity. In terms of stats, she gets plus 2 agility, and that's it. Well, at least she didn't lose any stats. So, Chie's evolved skill is very, very special. This is a full party heat riser. Sounds great, right? Well, there's a slight catch. It costs 150 SP. And Chie has among the worst SP stats of the entire party. Even at level 99, Chie just barely doesn't have enough SP to cast this twice. But, remember when I said the Chakra Ring had an interesting use on her earlier? If you give this to her, it'll cost 75 SP instead. Still not great, but it's a lot better than 150. Whether that's worth not giving the Chakra Ring to someone like Naoto or Yukiko though, that's debatable. Overall, this skill is basically awesome but impractical. But there are some setups where it can work decently, for example in shorter fights. In terms of mythology, Haraedo no Okami is a particular category of deities. Harae means purification. They're gods that, like many others, were born when Izanagi purified himself of the filth of the underworld. The Haraedo no Okami include Seoritsuhime, Haya Akitsuhime, Ibuki Donushi, and Hayasasura Hime. All of them are often considered interchangeable when it comes to worship, and they're collectively known as the Hara Edo no Okami. These deities are worshipped at the Sakunado Shrine in the Otsu region of Japan. In the P4 anime, the entire room is on fire by the end of the fight with Shadow Yukiko, and that's a pretty apt description of what will happen to her enemies in battle. Yukiko is probably one of the most straightforward party members in this game. She acts as both the primary healer and the primary magical nuke with fire spells. And her stats are heavily min-maxed towards that role, having massive SP and magic, but average to terrible everything else. Her bulk isn't awful by healer slash black mage standards, but it's still among the lowest of the party. In terms of skills, Yukiko gets a very good assortment of healing, status curing, revival spells, and at the end of the game, salvation, which is something that Persona 3's healers never got. On the offensive side, it's pretty much all fire all the time. As I said, Yukiko is very simple in her role, and she fits onto a lot of teams because of that. However, I personally have a lot more issues with her as a party member than I feel most people do, and I want to go into a few of them now. The first is, in a game where almost every party member can go mixed to some extent, Yukiko's physical attacks are nearly worthless. This means that if she's facing something immune to fire, she's completely shut down. And so she's pretty much forced to run fire break. That's already one skill slot used up, and that leads me to my other problem with Yukiko. I think she heavily suffers from limited move slot syndrome. Especially since one of her early social link skills in Golden is also pretty much necessary, so that's two of her skill slots already gone, before you even get into healing moves, of which she probably needs one party heal, one status heal, and one revival at minimum, until she gets salvation, and then you've got her fire skills, and then fire boost and fire amp. Combined with the fact that she gets some of the best bike skills in the game, so you want to save room for those, it's very easy to overcrowd her skill set if you're not careful. 
In my opinion, it's best to decide at the start of the game whether you want to go for a more healing based build or an offense based build, otherwise you might end up with a watered down version of both. And the final issue that I have is that unlike the physical attackers who get power charge, Yukiko can get mind charge, but you have to really go out of your way for it and you probably won't have time on a max social links run. And another magical attacker joins later in the game who has much easier access to mind charge as does the protagonist. But all that aside, Yukiko is still a fantastic healer, and she demolishes anything that is not immune to fire. I'm just in a minority that feels she might be a tad overrated in some circles. Yukiko's persona is based off of Konohana Sakuya Hime, which literally means Cherry Tree Blossom Blooming Princess, from Japanese mythology. She's the daughter of the Mountain God, or Yamatsumi, who appears as a persona in some games. Her symbol is the Sakura, or Cherry Blossom, and she's also the goddess of Mount Fuji and Volcanoes, which fits with her using fire here. But fire plays another part in her story. She was the wife of the god Ninigi, and when she became pregnant, he suspected that she had been unfaithful to him. So, she stood in a hut and set it on fire, claiming that the fire would not harm her or her children if she had truly been faithful, and she indeed emerged unscathed. In fact, in some accounts, she even gave birth inside the Burning Hearts. It's also said that since Ninigi chose to marry her rather than Oyamatsumi's other daughter, the Rock Goddess, human lives were destined to be short and fleeting like cherry blossoms rather than long and enduring like stone. Just as Izanagi's design takes influence from Japanese cheer squads, Konohana Sakuya is more based on Western cheerleaders in appearance to tie into Yukiko's support role. And now Yukiko, she has the best bike skills in the game by far. Seriously, it's not even a contest. What these skills do is allow for a more offensive focused build for her. Valiant Dance is unreliable, but if it works it drastically lowers the enemy's defense, making her offense even better, and you'll probably stick with it for a little while on your way to getting her better bike skills. Her second one, Mataru Unda, yes it's Mataru Unda, many sources have this wrong and say it's Maraku Unda, which would be even better, but for what it is, it's still kind of decent. Red Wall is probably the least worth its skill here. Spirit Drain essentially gives her infinite SP, though by the time you get it, SP isn't really that much of an issue. And finally, Mind Charge. The annoying thing is it requires five separate afternoons. I don't know if it's possible to work this into a max social links run, I'll have to look into it, but if you don't care about that, definitely go for this and always invite Yukiko out for bike rides whenever she's outside the gas station. Mind Charge is just that good. If you have any familiarity with Japanese mythology, you probably know who Amaterasu is. But if not, Amaterasu is the Japanese sun goddess, and one of the most important deities in traditional Japanese mythology. She was born from Izanagi after he cleansed himself of the filth from his trip to the underworld, she came from his left eye, while Sukuyomi the moon god came from his right eye and Suzanoo the storm god was born from his nose. In some accounts, Amaterasu and Sukuyomi together ruled the heavens for a while, while Suzanoo was assigned to the seas. Until Sukuyomi killed another deity and was branded as evil by Amaterasu for it, and thus day and night were separated. Amaterasu's relationship with her other brother Suzanoo was a little more complicated. Let's just say they had a major case of divine sibling rivalry going on, and their conflict escalated to the point where Suzanoo offended her so badly she chose to shut herself away in a cave for a while, depriving the world of light, but she was lured out by Ame no Uzume, and she and Suzanoo eventually reconciled. Many ancient texts claim that Japan's emperors are descended from Amaterasu, which is something the government milked for all it was worth during the Meiji Restoration, but I won't go into that here. She's also famous for Japan's three regalia, the Yata no Kagami, a mirror, Yasakani no Magatama, a jewel, and the sword Kusanagi no Tsurugi. 
which incidentally formed the basis for Amaterasu's three weapon types in Orkami. In gameplay terms, Amaterasu serves as Yukiko Amaki's awakened persona. In Persona 4, party members awaken once their social link reaches rank 10. Their stats change slightly, and in Yukiko's case it's a little weird. She loses one magic and two endurance. But she gains two agility and one luck. This is a bit of a downgrade overall, but on the other hand, her fire resistance turns into an immunity and she gains a resistance to electricity. Unfortunately, she keeps her ice weakness, and she did that in the original PS2 version as well. Amaterasu got indirectly buffed in Golden, simply from the fact that she wasn't nerfed, while a few other Awakened Personas were. With Yukiko's third awakening, she gets Burning Petals. This is one of the most famous of the third tier skills in this game. This is severe fire damage to all foes, the equivalent of a multi-target Ragnarok. It still suffers from the fact that severe tier spells were nerfed compared to Persona 3. It only has a little bit more power than Meraki Dine. Meraki Dine is 320, this is 400. It is relatively cheap though for its power, it's only around 30-ish SP. It's actually cheaper than Ragnarok, despite it being multi-target. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of um, Meraki Dine for this, although a lot of people um, like to joke how this skill is technically the equivalent of Mara's signature move from Persona 3. So, Yukiko's Persona, Sumeo Okami. This might actually be a translation mistake. In Japanese, it's Sume o Mikami, and that's actually what it's supposed to be. It's an epithet for Amaterasu, the Sun Goddess. It means Imperial Great Goddess, which references the fact that the Emperors of Japan claim to be descended from her. Kanji Tatsumi will be acting as the investigation team's muscle from now on, and boy does that show. His stat build is very straightforward, a lot like Yukiko. He's a typical Mighty Glacier, massive HP, strength and endurance, with his other stats being average to low, although his agility isn't that bad, all things considered, so his accuracy doesn't really suffer. Despite his massive HP and endurance, I wouldn't exactly call Kanji a tank, because it's hard to predict who gets targeted by enemies in this game. His HP is more there to pay for his physical attacks. And that's where Kanji really shines. By late game, he'll have one of the highest damage outputs of the entire party, against single targets. I'll get to that a bit later. In terms of his skill set, he mostly learns multi-hitting single target physical attacks, and physicals that do more damage to enemies that are knocked down. You might want to keep Vile Assault even after he learns Primal Force, because its damage output is crazy against downed enemies, especially backed by buffs and power charge. But wait, I hear you say, I don't see power charge on this learn set. Don't worry about that, that's all I'll say for now. On the other end of the spectrum, Kanji, despite having terrible magic, actually learns the entire line of Zeo spells. Like Chie, they're mostly there for knockdowns, but their high power goes a little way to make up for his lower magic, making him not as bad at mixed attacking as he might seem. He also learns some support skills, and this is the main thing that differentiates him from Chie. He starts out with Rakukaja, unfortunately he never learns the multi-target version of this, so you're likely to replace it after the early game. But Mataru Kaja is amazing. Drastically increasing the party's damage output, it's great against bosses. In Golden, Kanji also learns some regenerate skills to keep him healthy. Speaking of Golden, Kanji's level up learn set didn't change much in this version. He swapped out Mighty Swing for Torrent Shot, which I think is better, and he now starts with Regenerate 1. That's basically it in terms of changes. But his social link skills drastically improved him, to the point where I feel he's a lot better in this version. But there's one thing they didn't give Kanji, and this is his biggest weakness in my opinion. Kanji has no multi-target physical attacks, except one that you have to go out of your way to get, and even then it's only medium damage. 
Because of this, the general consensus among fans is that Chie is better against groups of enemies, while Kanji is better in boss fights. Which is definitely not a bad thing for Kanji in a game with a lot of tough bosses. Kanji's persona is Takemikazuchi, a Japanese thunder god born from the blood on Izanagi's sword after he slew the fire god Hino Kagutsuchi. He, along with, in some accounts, Futsunushi, was sent to claim the Izumo region for the gods. The local deity Okuninushi willingly surrendered, but his son, Take Minakata, wanted a test of strength before he would be convinced. And so Take Mikazuchi took him up on his challenge, and thus, sumo wrestling was invented. No really, Kanji's persona invented sumo wrestling, because it's actual Japanese mythology. He also broke both Take Minakata's arms in the process, and that's why the persona Take Minakata is always depicted with no arms. The sumo aspect I find interesting because Shadow Kanji, who, remember, is Take Mikazuchi, spoke like a ring announcer during the mini-boss fight of Kanji's dungeon. I always felt that was a bit of a nod to the mythology. Kanji's bike skills are actually pretty interesting, giving him utility he never had before by way of giving him multi-target healing spells. While I personally really like the idea of healing spells on Kanji, especially due to his good survivability, the problem is it takes a long time to get Mediarama, at which point Teddy, Yukiko and the protagonist will have easy access to full party healing, so I don't really know if it's worth it. I should also draw attention to Atom Smasher. This is the only AoE physical attack Kanji ever gets. And as you would have seen against Shadow Risei and Teddy, backed by Power Charge, it's capable of a lot of damage, but we've about reached the point in the game where medium physical damage just isn't cutting it anymore, so it's kind of our class by the time you first have access to it. I suppose Blue Wall is marginally the most useful wall skill since there are two members of the party weak to electricity. And Fast Heal is... bleh, in my opinion. My overall thoughts on Kanji's bike skills is they're a bit of a missed opportunity. They were so close to being really good, they just aren't quite there. Rokuten Mao means Demon King of the Sixth Heaven and is a figure in Japanese Buddhism symbolizing the lust for power and the desire to attain worldly goals. He works to tempt Buddhists away from their path, and is sometimes considered synonymous with Mara. However, that's not what this persona is meant to represent, because Rokuten Mao is also a title that the Japanese warlord Oda Nobunaga gave himself. Although some people believe he was being sarcastic when he said that, and according to Persona 4's art book, this is who Kanji's ultimate persona is actually meant to represent. Nobunaga was one of the Sengoku or Warring States period's most successful warlords, who, after becoming leader of his clan, set out on a campaign to conquer and unify the states of Japan. And he almost succeeded, until he was betrayed by one of his generals, Akechi Mitsuhide, for reasons that no one knows for sure even to this day. He was forced to commit seppuku inside the Honoji Temple, which he reportedly ordered to be set on fire beforehand, and that's what the flames on this persona's design represents. One of his generals, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, eventually picked up where Nobunaga left off, leading to one of his allies, Tokugawa Ieyasu, forming the Tokugawa Shogunate that would rule Japan for the next two centuries. Nobunaga is an interesting choice for an ultimate persona for Kanji in a few ways. Firstly, this guy gets the historical villain upgrade in Japan constantly, to the point where his title of Mao is basically the equivalent of Dark Lord in the West, the generic title for villains in pop culture. But Nobunaga is also someone who is considered quite strange in his life. He didn't seem to care for social conventions, acting rudely to nobles and politely to commoners, being somewhat negative towards Buddhism but dealing with foreigners openly, which was unthinkable to most Japanese leaders at the time, and using a lot of unconventional tactics on the battlefield, embracing Western firearms in particular. And I could also say that it may tie into Kanji's ambiguous sexuality, since Nobunaga had a wife, but 
is also generally agreed to have been in a sexual relationship with his male retainer Ranmaru. In gameplay terms, upon evolving his persona, Kanji gains plus one to all stats, if only the other party members' upgrades were that simple. In terms of resistances though, Rokuten Mao got a bit of a nerf in Golden. In the original game, he joined the likes of Chie and Yosuke's ultimate personas in having no weaknesses. He not only has a weakness now, he also doesn't gain an additional resistance like many other ultimate personas do. But if you're a fan of using Kanji, all I'll say is, don't despair just yet. Kanji's persona evolution is very interesting. Remember when I said earlier that don't despair yet if you like Kanji? Well, his third tier persona resists physical. The only party member who does this, which is very unique, and his unique skill is not really all that great, unfortunately. The man's way. This is just a random chance of knockdown or dizzy to all enemies. Some people see this as a replacement for Mazeodyne, since that's also Kanji's main source of knockdown. It's, again, like, it's a very luck-reliant skill, but it can sometimes knock down enemies that have no weaknesses, and instant dizzy can be nice too. As for mythology, Takeji Zaiten is an alternate name of the Dai Rokuten Mao, the actual mythological one, not Nobunaga this time. Its name literally means having pleasure from watching over living things change. From now on, Risei Kujikawa will be taking over for Teddy as our navigator. And unlike him, she has a persona that's geared entirely towards navigation, who will level up alongside the party and learn new skills to aid in battle and exploration. First thing I want to mention, yes, Himiko does have stats, they don't actually mean anything. They're just there for completeness. Risei learns skills very sporadically, but as she's always counted as being in the party, she levels up very quickly. Her first two skills, Treasure Radar and Enemy Radar, display the enemies and chests on an entire floor, even in places you haven't explored yet. Not only does this make exploration easier, as you know where to go if you want items or if you want to fight enemies, and know where to avoid if you don't want to fight, but it also indirectly helps you find out where the stairs are, because enemies and chests will never spawn in the stairs room. In other words, they'll be in a part of the map with no stars or red dots. Certain escape is also very convenient, yes I missed one, I'll get back to that later, but it doesn't come until very very late into the game. The real gem here is Relaxing Wave. Once Risei learns this, we pretty much never need to worry about SP management in dungeons ever again. At the point where you get it, 5% is a lot. You aren't likely to go through that much in a single battle. And that means it's very easy to break even or even make a profit of SP in every fight. And if you ever do find yourself running low, just go back to an early dungeon and fight weak enemies repeatedly to recharge. So, uh, sorry Fox, but at level 61, Risei kind of put you out of business. You just got out-hustled. You think that's good? What if I told you this isn't nearly the best Risei has to offer? Because I'm not even going into her social link skills. Even in the original PS2 version, Risei learned skills through her social link. In Golden, she gets even better ones. Risei's persona is Queen Himiko a legendary figure from Japanese mythology that, again, you will probably have heard of if you played Orkami. She is typically depicted as a wise, benevolent queen loved by all, who has prophetic powers. However, Himiko's actual history I find very fascinating. Firstly, her myths are pretty ancient, dating back to the 3rd century, before Japan was even called Japan. Secondly, these 3rd century sources are not Japanese, they're actually Chinese, and they depict Himiko as having good foreign relations with China at the time. Neither the Kojiki nor the Nihon Shoki, Japan's two oldest and most famous sources for mythology, mention Himiko at all. This has led to Himiko becoming quite a controversial figure, with a lot of scholarly debate over exactly which region of Japan she ruled over. 
Whether she's entirely fictional or based on a real historical person, and if she was based on a real person, exactly who she was based off of. According to sources, there were several different ancient Japanese queens who all could have conceivably been her. Heck, even her name is debated because technically speaking, it's ancient Japanese transliterated into Chinese transliterated into modern Japanese. So it's likely her real name isn't anything close to Himiko. Because of all this, I really have to applaud whoever decided to make this Risei's persona. It just fits on so many levels. Since Risei doesn't fight, her bike skills are unique. She just gets a buff to the all-out attack damage boost that she provides when she helps out. The more bike rides you have with her, the higher her all-out attack damage boost is. That's pretty much it. Kanzeon is the Japanese translation of the Chinese translation of the Bodhisattva Avelokiteshvara. And my apologies if I pronounce that badly, I don't have much experience with Sanskrit. A Bodhisattva is not a Buddha, but one who is on the way to becoming one. And Kanzeon embodies the compassion of all Buddhas. Appearing across many cultures and being considered either male or female, but it's the Chinese variant that is the one most popular in East Asian cultures like Japan. Depicted as female and being associated with mercy, compassion, and sometimes children and mothers. Her name means one who perceives the sounds of the world, very fitting for a navigator persona. And she's sometimes called the one with a thousand arms and thousand eyes. The extra arms granted to her so she could help as many people in need as possible. Many temples in East Asia are dedicated to her, including the Kyomizudera or Pure Water Temple in Kyoto, a place that I have personally visited. She's a major figure in Journey to the West as well, being the one who delivers the ring that allows control of the Monkey King. Now, I'm going to take a moment to gush about just how perfect a persona this is for Risei. Firstly, an alternate reading of her name is Kanon, and if that sounds familiar to you, the famous Japanese camera brand is indeed named after her. Fitting for someone in show business. But more importantly, Kanzeon has had many different forms and many different names across the years and across multiple cultures. Especially in Japan, where some of her aspects include horse-headed Kanon, a protector of horses and farm animals, safe childbirth Kanon, a depiction of her as a woman holding an infant, that iconography is so similar to the Virgin Mary that underground Christian sects in Japan used it as a cover, and even senility healing Kanon, an invention by a religious goods manufacturer in the 20th century. In other words, Kanzeon has had many different roles or many different selves across different cultures and different eras, constantly adapting even to modern times, and yet all of these are her. There could not be a more perfect persona for Risei. Gushing aside, in gameplay Kanzeon is a little weird. Firstly, all of her stats seem to get reset to 2. This might be a bug, but it doesn't really matter since Risei's stats don't do anything regardless. She doesn't specifically learn a new skill upon evolution, unlike the other party members' personas, instead just getting a new ability for rank 10 of the social link. In the original Persona 4, it seems like this was Weakness Scan, which Risei got a lot earlier in Golden. In Golden, it's the ability to revive the protagonist on death once per battle. Combined with the other party members take a mortal blow for you abilities, and you have a lot of safety nets against game overs now. If you ever want to do a challenge run of Persona 4, I'd recommend just leaving Risei at rank 1. Her social link abilities make the game that much easier. And she no longer has that bug that makes all of her stats go down to 2, not that her stats really matter anyway. But the main draw of this, well the only draw of this, but it's still amazing, is complete analysis. This is exactly what it says on the tin. From now on, if we press the L1 button on an enemy, we know all of its elemental affinities and all of its skills. No more waiting for scans, no more trial and error. 
Kozeon herself is simply another translation of Kanzeon or Avalokiteshvara's name. While Kanzeon means observer of mundane voices, Kozeon means light of mundane voices. Pretty bear to be amazed as Teddy bears his claws and banishes the shadows. Okay, I'll stop. Teddy is a very interesting party member. From a purely statistical standpoint, he's kind of just a worse Yukiko. He has better HP but worse endurance, and his magic and SP are his best stats and they're lower than hers. But what he lacks in stats, Teddy makes up for in a wide variety of support abilities. Getting the non-support ones out of the way first, Teddy is the party's main ice user, as Chie really doesn't care about her ice skills besides knockdowns. With boost and amp, he can dish out pretty impressive ice damage later in the game. He also learns a few physical skills, even more in Golden, but really, I just prefer to use Teddy's standard attack if I want to be doing physical damage with him. His strength isn't that bad, but I just find his skill slots are better spent on other things. Speaking of other skills that are usually the first to go for me, Energy Shower is good for a few fights, and after that you can just get rid of it. And Triesto is okay, but Goho M's are plentiful enough that you don't really need it. The main role Teddy plays is to be the team's secondary healer next to Yukiko. He learns all of the healing skills apart from Salvation, though he does get Medea Rahan later than Yukiko does, but for a lot of the game I feel they're about even as primary healers go. The main thing that Teddy has over her is his buffs. He gets Mataru Kaja, a fantastic buff, at only level 42. By comparison, the other person who gets it is Kanji, and he doesn't learn it until level 60. Later on, he also learns the full party defense buff, and through his social link, even though I don't like to spoil these, he does get a very good debuff as well. The choice of Teddy versus Yukiko as a support party member is very much a personal thing, but I personally prefer Teddy. And that's because whether it's healing, buffing, or doing ice damage, or even using physical attacks, I feel Teddy always has at least something productive to do with his turn, and that's something that I can't really say for Yukiko. Something about Teddy that could be either a weakness or a strength, depending on what you're facing, is the fact that he's the only party member in Persona 4 to share a weakness with someone else. He's weak to electricity just like Yosuke. And for a certain reason, Golden even encourages you to put them both in the same party. Against enemies that use electric skills, this is very bad, but it also means there's less variety of weaknesses in the party if you have both of them, so you may be more likely to encounter things that don't have at least someone's weakness. Teddy's persona is Kintoki Doji, a title that the Japanese folk hero Kintaro took for himself. Kintaro literally means golden boy, and he was said to be a toddler with superhuman strength, able to wrestle giant carp and even tame wild bears, hence him being Teddy's persona. It's customary to put up a Kintaro doll on what used to be Boys' Day but is now Children's Day as a way of praying that young boys will grow up to be big and strong. In keeping with Teddy's mysterious origins, Kintaro has various origin stories from being based on a real person to more fanciful like his mother being a mountain hag who was impregnated by a bolt of lightning. No, I'm not making that up. But in terms of Kintoki Doji's design in this game, there are a couple of elements I want to draw your attention to. Why is he carrying a giant missile if he's based on a Japanese folk legend? Well, Kintaro was always depicted using a tomahawk. The missile the persona is carrying is in fact a tomahawk missile. Also, Kintaro was often depicted wearing a bib with the character for gold on it. Now that's not anywhere on this persona, but that valve looking thing on the persona's belly, it is actually the elemental symbol for gold. How fitting that even the visual design of Teddy's persona is full of puns. Skipping ahead to Teddy's, well, rollerblade skills I guess, there are some okay options in here. Dekunda, while situational, is useful for getting rid of debuffs on the party. Life Drain is almighty damage, but it's very low damage and healing, so I don't find it that great. Mustard Bomb is, I believe, the only AoE physical that Teddy gets. 
and innovation can help if you're lucky enough to trigger it. Teddy getting white wall here is proof that he's considered the party's real ice user, sorry Chie. And then there's his fifth skill. I saw a forum post once when I was researching this that sums up Teddy's bike skills pretty well for me. Eh, evade physical is kinda nice I guess. Though whether it's worth 5 bike rides, you be the judge. Kamui are the spiritual and divine beings in the mythology of the Ainu people, the indigenous peoples of the Hokkaido region. The concept of Kamui is often compared to the concept of Japanese Kami, but they're not quite the same. Kamui can refer to anything regarded in Ainu culture as especially positive or especially strong. There are kamui associated with many things, animals, plants, the weather, human tools, sometimes even natural phenomenon. Teddy's persona is supposed to represent a specific one of them, Kim Un Kamui, the kamui of mountains and bears. Bears play a prominent role in Ainu mythology and are often considered benevolent figures. The Ainu had no writing system of their own before Japanese intervention, so much of their mythology is passed down through oral tradition, in the form of epics called Kamui Yukar. This persona's design has a subtle reference to an Ainu ritual, the Iomante, which involves rearing a bear cub for two years before it is killed with arrows, presented with offerings, and eaten as a way of releasing it to the realm of the Kamui. The reference is the missile embedded in this persona's body. It's a Russian Strelia rocket, which literally means arrow. Morbid though it is, Teddy's persona still can't help but contain visual puns. One thing I'd like to mention here is that the Japanese government only officially proposed to consider the Ainu an indigenous group in June 2008, about a month before the original version of Persona 4 released in Japan. However, their status was not made official until a bill in 2019. Like Kanji, Teddy simply gets plus one to all stats on his persona evolving. But unique among party members is the fact that he not only turns his resistance into an immunity, he gains two additional resistances, wind and darkness. Despite still keeping his electric weakness, this does make Teddy one of the most durable party members. Kamui Miracle. This is a skill that a lot of people write off as being terrible. It costs 25 SP and it has random effects. Either all allies and or all foes have their HP and SP fully recovered, all allies and or all foes are knocked down, all allies and or all foes are inflicted with random status ailments, or nothing at all. So this is a bit of a joke skill, but I actually want to say something. I think it does have one niche use, and that is free SP restoration. Another thing the Fox should feel bad about because we're basically putting them out of business again. If you're running very low on SP, you can go to an early game dungeon and fight some weak enemies and just spam this skill, provided that Teddy has at least 25 SP and eventually you're bound to get the full SP recovery. This in particular is actually quite useful during the golden exclusive dungeon, and for that reason I'm gonna keep this skill for now. Teddy does get three immunities in this form too, draining ice and nulling wind and darkness. And in terms of mythology, this one's kind of interesting. So, Kamui Mosir refers to the land of the Kamui in Ainu mythology, however its name comes from the Ainu creation myth. At the beginning of the world there was only water and earth mixed together in kind of a sludgy mass. Then the first Kamui sent down a bird spirit, Moshiri Ko Kamui. This wagtail bird stomped on this swampy state, pounding the earth, and after much effort, areas of dry land appeared. So, in a way, this persona could also represent that bird spirit, Moshiri Ko Kamui. First thing to mention about Naoto, 
she got buffed heavily in Golden. She might be the most changed party member in this version. I'll start by covering aspects of her that are the same across both versions. Firstly, she's the one party member to have no weaknesses, aside from some of the Ultimate Personas in the PS2 version. Which makes her very versatile, able to slot into almost any battle or any party combination. Her stat build focuses on magic, though not quite to the extent of Yukiko, but she also has the highest agility of the party. Which means she's likely to be going first all the time, or after the protagonist in ambush encounters. The downside is her endurance is extremely low, so she goes down very quickly if she's not dodging. When it comes to skills, I'll get the, in my opinion, worst one out of the way first. She learns a lot of physical attacks, and her strength isn't terrible, but I find that her variety of magical skills plus her higher magic stats, and a certain skill that she gets out of her social link mean that I almost never have room for these on builds. Blight's poison chance is kind of decent I suppose, but I rarely see people use physical attacks on Naoto. In the PS2 version, she only really learned two other forms of skills, light and dark based instant death, and the Megado line. This meant she was excellent at sweeping through random encounters, but because light and dark don't work on bosses and the Megado line in the PS2 version was stupidly expensive in terms of SP, she really suffered in boss fights. All that combined with her late join time meant I never really heard a lot of positives about her in the original game. However, here is where Golden fixed things immensely. Firstly, they added a lot more enemies that are weak to light and dark, especially in the next dungeon. In addition, Golden also gave the Megado line of spells a huge decrease in SP cost. For example, Megadola on used to be 60 SP, it's now 38. But not only did Naoto's base skill set get buffed, she also gained new tools. Firstly, she starts with Agidine and Garudine now, and she has access to Zeodine and Bufudine via bike skills, giving her potentially quad elemental coverage. She also learns Tetrakan and Makarakan now, making her the only character besides the protagonist with access to reflectors outside of items. In the next major story boss in particular, having two Khan users is extremely useful, so I'd recommend keeping these skills at least until then. I alluded to bike skills before and I will just say Naoto also has the best bike skills in the game next to Yukiko, but on the subject of non-level up skills, there is one that I need to mention here. Naoto gets Mind Charge via her social link, or early via level up in the PS2 version. And it's way easier to get this than it is to get it on Yukiko, which means Naoto will likely be your best magical damage dealer. Another indirect buff in Golden is that in the original, the only moves she could use this with were her Megado skills, which were, again, really expensive. But Golden's addition of the Dine spells give her some much cheaper single target damage with this. The only other skills I haven't gone over here are Hummer and Mudor Boost. I find these are very much a personal preference thing. If you like Naoto being able to sweep random enemies that aren't weak to light or dark, then by all means keep these. But if you only plan on using Hummer and Mudor on enemies that are weak to them, and thus are pretty much guaranteed to die to them, you can easily save space for other skills by giving up these ones. That's the thing with Naoto, she's quite versatile and there are a lot of viable builds on her. My personal favourite is keeping one single target elemental spell, Mind Charge, Mahama on, Mahmuda on, Megadola on, with the remaining slots being left open for Tetrakan, Makarakan, or passives, depending on what point in the game I'm at. But feel free to share how you personally use her too. If you're playing along with the original PS2 version though, she is sadly nowhere near as good there. Naoto's persona is Sukuna Hikona, also pronounced Sukuna Bikona, a Japanese kami associated with healing, agriculture, and interestingly enough, sake brewing, as well as hot springs. His, and yes it is a he, name means Small Lord of Renown, which is because he is no bigger than the size of a thumb. He arrived in the Izumo region in a small boat made of bark and he was clad in goose skin, which is referenced in his design in SMT4 Apocalypse, and was first discovered by Okuninushi, who he developed a fast friendship with and the two went on many adventures. 
His association with hot springs began when he fell ill. Okuninushi brought him to the Dogo Hot Springs, which is a real place, and the waters revived him. That reminds me of a certain angel. Much like Kanji's persona is said to have invented something traditionally Japanese, Sukuna Hikona is sometimes credited as the inventor of sake. As I said before, he's also associated with healing and medicine, which is ironic considering that healing skills are one of the few types of skills he can't learn in P4. Farmers would pray to him to protect their crops from insects, and due to his interactions with a certain legendary empress, he is also said to help with women's health and safe childbirth. A pretty varied resume for a god, which certainly fits Naoto's all-round skill set. Blink and you miss it, but Naoto actually pulls out some kind of Uzi instead of her normal weapon for her cavalry attack. Anyway, I said earlier that Naoto has the second best bike skills in the game behind Yukiko. Her starting two are Bufudine and Zeodine, which combined with her original skills, give her access to quad elements if you want to go that route. But I'm going to borrow a certain other LP's catchphrase here and say I want to give special attention to Bufudine. Naoto gets a weapon from Shiroku Pub that has an ice boost effect. This makes Mind Charge Bufudine Naoto's best single target damage by the end game. And it only takes one bike hangout to get this, something you can easily make time for even on a max social link playthrough. Then there's Tetraja, which I personally find way too situational to be useful, especially with scapegoat eggplants and homunculi. On top of all of the personas available that null light and dark. Myriad Arrows is an okay option, and it would be great on a physical attacker, but I personally don't like using Naoto as one. And her final bike skill is Angelic Greats. This combos very well with her high agility, making her a lot more durable via dodge tanking, so if you have time for 5 bike hangouts, and even if you don't, you only need one for arguably Naoto's best bike skill. So overall, I'd say Naoto's bike skills are really good. Yamato Takeru is a person who may have really existed, but is mostly the source of legends. Chronicled in Japan's two most famous mythological texts, the Kojiki and Nihon Shoki, he was originally Prince Osu, the son of the supposed 12th Emperor of Japan. He slew his brother, which caused his father to send him away to the Izumo region out of fear, but there the prince still defeated whatever enemies came across him. One of them he defeated via disguising himself by cross-dressing as a maid. This must be why he's Naoto's ultimate persona. It was from one of these enemies that he received his title, Yamato Takeru, or the Brave of Yamato. His aunt later lent him the sword Kusanagi, a name that anyone familiar with Japanese mythology will know. It's the same sword Susanoo used to slay Orochi. And a really cool detail in the persona designs is that sword Yamato Takeru is holding is the same sword held by Yukiko's Amaterasu, confirming that this is supposed to be Kusanagi. Accounts of exactly how he died vary, but a statue of him now stands in Kanazawa. As a legendary hero who may or may not have been based on a real person who receives a magic sword, some historians have felt there might be a common link between his legend and that of King Arthur. In gameplay terms, upon awakening to Yamato Takeru, Naoto loses one point of magic and luck but gains one endurance. Why, exactly? Well, it's probably worth gaining an immunity to light and dark, along with a resistance to fire. Not needing to worry about your Mind Charge Mega Dolon user getting whacked by an unlucky Hammer or Mudo is definitely appreciated. Naoto's exclusive skill is Shield of Justice. This is very expensive in terms of SP, but it puts up a shield that blocks one attack for the entire party. It only lasts one turn, including almighty attacks. This is very, very useful at this point, since there are going to be a lot of enemies using almighty, and they often telegraph their strongest attacks. In terms of mythology, Yamato Sumeragi, who actually had its name changed in the English version, in Japanese it was Yamato Sumera Mikoto, but I guess that couldn't fit. They're both the same thing anyway. They're both just epithets for the emperors of Japan. The term Yamato comes from a province in early Japan, 
And that name comes from the characters for Great and Wa. Wa was the original name of Japan used by China when it was first discovered, but it was originally written with the character representing submissive or passive, and Japan ended up changing that to the character for peace or harmony, which is what's stayed ever since.